One of the realities that we face in life is cancer. We see that this happens and too often happening to people that we love dearly and we don't know what to do. We want to know, how can I help? What can I do when such a situation happens, both for those that are afflicted with cancer, as well as for the families and friends and close colleagues and people that we know? Well, I discovered a book by Christine Clifford, which is called How Can I Help? Specifically written for this. She is a person that has dealt with this and uh, has had to deal with it. Matter of fact, as I look at some of the things she's done, she is a person that before she had her bout with breast cancer, she uh, has definitely cracked the glass ceiling by age 40. She was a senior executive vice president for the SPAR group, that's S-P-A-R, an international information and merchandising services firm in New York. And she was once the top salesperson in the multi-billion dollar service industry. Her accounts included Toys R Us, Kmart, Walmart, AT&T, and many, many others. She went on helping double the sales of that company and do a lot. Then she was diagnosed with breast cancer in December of 94. And she went on to write a humorous portrayal, just to give you an example of how wonderful this lady is, to write a humorous book called Not Now, I'm Having a No Hair Day. And I think I can relate to that one there too. But uh, Christine's newest book is How Can I Help? And that's the one here that we're going to talk about today. And to do that very well, Christine is joining us right now from her summer home in the Minneapolis area. Christine Clifford, so good to have you with us today. So good to be with you, Terry. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's good to have you here. You and I have known each other through the National Speakers Association, where we're both uh, CSPs, a certified speaking professional. You have done that and have gone on to be one of the outstanding speakers in the healthcare industry. So congratulations on that. And uh, tell us a little bit about your story. I understand you've gone through cancer, not just uh, once there in 94, but also there was a relapse in 2013. Tell us a little bit about what's happened and how you're doing now. Well, you know, I always say my story really started when I was about 15 years old because my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 38, and uh, she lived for four years, and so by, when she passed away, I was about 19 years old. So I grew up back before there were things like what you're doing, and there were, you know, pink ribbon events and cancer awareness all over the world. Back in those days, nobody talked about it. It, My mom came home from the hospital, closed the drapes, and virtually never left her bedroom. And And that's kind of what I grew up with, and my brothers and sisters. So when I was originally diagnosed, Terry, at the age of 40, back in 1994, I thought, you know, I don't know if I've got six days, six months, or six years to live. But however long I have, I want to make the most of every day. And more importantly, I wanted my children not to go through what I had gone through as a young girl. I wanted them to enjoy life. So um, I actually had had my surgery and was home for about three days, lying up in bed, and the doorbell Uh, rang and my youngest son Brooks answered the doorbell and yelled upstairs to me mom more flowers for your breast (laughs) (laughs) and I started to laugh and I thought oh my gosh this feels so good to laugh I've been feeling sorry for myself all these weeks that I've known about it and so I felt like I was going to be able to get back to somewhat of a normal sense of life So then what happened is I started my treatments, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and one night, I call this my twilight zone story, by the way, but one night I woke up in the middle of the night and went downstairs into my library and sat at my desk, and on the spot, I sketched 50 cartoons of things that people had said to me or done to me or I had done to myself that seemed whimsical and seemed kind of humorous. Ah, very nice. Now, the interesting thing, Terry, is, and you, you've you known me, I was not uh, humorous, and I had never drawn anything in my entire life. I wasn't even a doodler, you know, who would sit there and draw things. So I went back to bed, pulled the sheets under my chin, and thought, what was that? It just came out of nowhere. 
So the next morning I got up and went to both a Barnes and Noble and the public library. And I walked up to the information counter and said, I'd like to see all of your humorous books on cancer, please. Ooh, and what did they say? <laughs> well, both of their reactions ended up being cartoons in my first little book, Not Now I'm Having a No Hair Day, because the, the male clerk at Barnes & Noble peered at me over the you know, counter, and he said, humorous book about cancer? You're sick. And I thought, hello, you know, this is ironic. So well, I just, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then uh, the librarian, she actually got on her computer and she finally dragged me down into the bowels of the library and took me down this aisle where you needed a ladder to get up to the top shelf. And she pointed up and she said, there it is, the humorous book on cancer. And it was a book that Irma Bombeck had written about her cancer experience. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm on to something. But boy, I was, I was unaware that this was going to change my entire life. Yeah, well, you have uh, used humor, which is very important. We don't think that those two go together, cancer and humor. Uh, they're, but they're both very serious. And they both are helpful, and humor is very good. Well, now, if it's all right with you, I want to go through some of the things that you talk about in your book, which is really good. I've read this, read it twice. It's very easy to read, oh, very okay. uncomfortable. And you talk about what to do in various stages. Like, for instance, here on page uh, 16, you talk about coming home. This is the prime time to connect with a cancer patient to let them know that they are in your thoughts and prayers and that you are thinking of them. Silent gestures a friendship with cards, handwritten notes, flowers will let the patient know that you've heard about their situation and are there to support them. You are giving those of us that have loved ones, friends, colleagues who have cancer, letting us know what to do. Tell me a little bit more about that and how we can help that person in a real way when we say, I want to help you. If there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. Well, Christine, what can we do to help? Well, it's, it's the million dollar question, Terry, because as a patient, I literally went through the experience of walking into a grocery store and seeing someone who knew me and they immediately turned around and walked the other way. And I knew it was because they, they didn't know what to say and they didn't want to say the wrong thing. So what's very typical with most people is they end up saying nothing because they really don't know what to do. Yeah, exactly. We don't know. We don't want to say the wrong thing. And we think, well, I'll just not say anything because I don't. And we want to usually say something positive, but that's not the appropriate thing either. So having been a patient twice, I can tell you the thing that got me through every day was that every, the, the first year that I went through cancer treatment back in 1994, we're talking about old protocols. I had to do chemotherapy twice a month for 12 months. And I had to do radiation therapy for 33 days, plus recover from my surgery. So we were, you're talking about over a year that I was in treatment. And not one day of that year went by when I didn't get a call or a card or an email or flowers, or a meal dropped off, and I actually felt like, oh my gosh, someone is thinking about me today. And that inspired me to keep going and get through my treatments yes. and to, to, to develop a positive attitude. So I think the challenge, Terry, is that um, people just don't know what to say and they don't know what to do, and they'll offer the cancer patient something like what can I do to help you know and the cancer patient often doesn't have any ideas or you know can't think I don't want to you know impose on people I don't want to become dependent on people so you're in a catch-22 so to speak so what I write about is take the bulls by the horn I've got all kinds of examples of things that people can do at the various stages like you mentioned and just do it because I can guarantee you the cancer patient will love it. 
Yeah, well, I'd like to go in more in depth on that because I hear on page uh, 24, you talk about six down, six to go, and you talk a guide through chemotherapy. What you did in the book, I've not seen this anywhere. You say, when you're going through chemotherapy, here's something you can do, and here's something to be aware of for your friends that are going through. When you're going through radiation, here's what to do. So, so let's say uh, I'm getting nitty gritty on that. What can someone do that is really practical and real, as you mentioned in the book? Well, let's, let's start with some of the stages, and let's start with the very beginning stage. Okay. You might be out there listening to Terry and I talking, and maybe you've just heard that your beloved grandmother or grandfather has cancer, and they haven't even had any kind of treatments or surgery yet. They've just found out. And that is probably the worst place a cancer patient can be, is just finding out you have cancer. It changes your whole world, turns your whole world upside down. In that stage, one of the best things I think someone can do is offer to take the cancer patient to their various appointments. At that stage, the cancer patient is actually interviewing surgeons, interviewing oncologists, interviewing radiologists. For the most part, they're trying to put their team together, but they get in the office and all they can think about is, I have cancer, I have cancer, I have cancer. So they're not necessarily listening, and they may not be absorbing everything that those doctors are saying to them. So one of the things I always offer or suggest to people is offer to be a second pair of ears and go with a notebook and take extensive notes about what was said from both your friend or family member and the doctor. Good That's idea. one of the things you can do right off the bat in those initial stages. I like it. So I'm taking that and you're helping them with it. Well, now building on top of that, also you mentioned things specifically like parties or uh, you have a car that might need to be serviced and things like that. Tell us a bit about some of those things that you mentioned in the book. Well, one of the things that I started to do for cancer patients um, is let's say they had to have surgery. So they're checked into the hospital. I would... Uh, talk to the human resources department at the hospital and say, I'm going to throw a little party in the lobby for the closest friends and family of this cancer patient. And I'm going to have a guest book for them to sign. I'm going to have, you know, treats there for them to eat and beverages for them to drink because the friends and family that come and sit all day, maybe even 24 hours waiting for the surgery to be done they're just as anxious as the cancer patient. And so, you know, I always would put these little parties together in the lobby, and then we'd have this guest book that could be taken up to the cancer patient when they've kind of come out of surgery, anesthesia, and all that, and say, these are all the people that stopped by the hospital today just to let you know that they were thinking about you. That is a brilliant idea. I like the way that you address that and what you say. Matter of fact, for those of you that are watching this, you might want to make sure you do a Google search on The Cancer Club. This is the club that Christine formed. And uh, Christine, I know you've helped many people on that. Tell us a little bit about The Cancer Club and what uh, kind of good things you've seen from that. Well, can it's cancerclub.com. Uh, the word the is not in the URL, but... Um, we had a newsletter that went out for 25 years that um, I've stopped producing it just because I've got so many things going on in my life. But we had a newsletter and people would join the cancer club. Uh, as you know, Terry, I've traveled the world speaking about my cancer experience and speaking about how people can help, how people can use humor, you know, what, what can friends, you know, I've written a little book for a, uh, children, you know, whose families are going through cancer treatment as well, because it's so difficult for parents to talk to children about, you know, what's going on in their life. Um, so the Cancer Club is an inclusive, I always say it's an inclusive club, because virtually every person that I have ever met in my life knows someone who has had cancer. And so the Cancer Club is an inclusive club. It includes all the friends, the family, the colleagues from work, um, your neighbors, you know, you name it. And we probably all know someone going through this. So I'm all about helping people find a positive attitude, 
find some humor and find some great ways to support the cancer patients. Yes, indeed. And you do that continually. Well, as, before we let you go, one of the things I really would like you to do is think about the people that are watching this video. There are going to be those who have cancer, been diagnosed that way. They might be at various stages. Uh, what you would say to that person. And then also to the people that have friends. They've just got word that oh, so-and-so, their colleague, their friend, their loved one, someone close has kids, and they feel awkward. They don't know what to do. Those two people that could be watching this, what would you say to them? Well, the first thing I would say is to research all the possibilities. Spend the time on the internet finding out what hospitals in, in the country are the best if you have that kind of option, what protocols are the best. Because as a patient, I have always gone in and said, if I have to have chemotherapy, can I have these drugs? If I have to have chemotherapy, can I have this pain uh, painkiller? Can I? So I asked for things by name. And so because there are so many changes in oncology on a daily basis, virtually every university college in the country is working on finding a cure and finding new protocols, that my number one piece of advice, if you've just been diagnosed, is research all the possibilities. Makes a lot of sense. With things changing very rapidly in medicine, what wasn't possible yesterday might be possible today or tomorrow. And so very good point, research. What else would you say? The second thing is don't be afraid to ask people for help. The love and support that people want to give you, they truly want to give it to you, can get you through this experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the reasons that this book, How Can I Help, was it was written both for cancer patients and for the friends and family and loved ones of cancer patients because if a cancer patient you know, can't find the nerve to say, gee, you know, it's summer, and I'd really like you to come over and rake up all the leaves that fell in the spring. They can Xerox a page out of this book and just hand it to someone and say, you know, this would be really helpful for me. Very good idea. Something very practical. It seemed like it would be good to have a checklist. And the, by the way, for those of you watching this, the book has a lot of ideas specific. This is a book you want to get. And you can go through, see specifics of what you can practically do. Some things that are fun. You create a fun environment for all those that are supporting the cancer patient. And so these are really good. Christine, you did a great job on that one. Oh, thank you. And, you know, the, the third thing, uh, I just want to touch back to, um, you were talking about kind of my goal to create a party atmosphere. I don't in any way, shape or form want to take away from the seriousness of this disease. I mean, I lost my mother. I've lost dear friends, you know, family members. And, uh, but one of the things that somebody did for me all those years ago was on the night before I was scheduled to start my chemotherapy, they threw a chemotherapy shower for me. So everyone was asked to bring a, a gift and um, we were going to play poker and have some margaritas and break a pinata and all this stuff. And, you know, it took my fear away for the following day. I wasn't even thinking about, you know, having Excellent. to start chemotherapy the next day. So I'm a big advocate of that, you know, setting a positive mood. Uh, another quick suggestion if your friend is going to be in the hospital for three nights, a week, a month, bring in some brightly colored sheets and a pillowcase and a picture of their family and a jar, you know, a vase of flowers and make their room feel a little bit festive and not so, you know, sterile. And, uh, you know, you can usually get permission from the hospital to do that, especially if you bring in brand new sheets that are still wrapped in plastic and say, you know, these, these are clean. You know, we'd, we'd like to, you know, decorate the bed. I like it. Very, very good idea. Well, now let's go into another area that you address in the book. I think it was very, very important. Something we don't get training on. Of what do we do in the situation where people are getting better? We know that. That's a little okay. bit easier. But if someone has been told they're not going to be around, they've got a week or two weeks, it's very bad. From the person's point of view who has that, and then also from people that go, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Like the person you were talking about, they just kind of turned and walked away from you. What to do? What would you say for a person when we've received that kind of word from the 
the medical people involved and they say, uh, you only have this amount of time, there's nothing more we can do. What would you say in that situation? First of all, Terry, that, you know, that is the hardest thing to hear. We, we can't help you any longer. Number one thing I'm going to say is don't ever let anybody give you a timetable for how long you are going to live or how long your friend or family member is going to live. When I was diagnosed in 1994, I was stage three metastatic cancer, and one of the doctors told me I should get my affairs in order. I had six months to live. My kids were 10 and eight. They're now 34 and 32. I'm the mother of two grandchildren. And if I had listened to that person and said, oh, woe is me, you know, my life would have been totally different. So if, if you've been told that and, or a friend and family member has been told that, again, making a human connection, go and sit with that person and read a book or listen to a book on tape or watch a funny movie or share your memories with that person because that is the point of life when someone needs help the most. They are already feeling alone. They know that their time is limited. And if you can go and sit with them and just reminisce about what you did as teenagers or college students or business colleagues, hold their hand, tell them you love them, that's the most important thing you can do. Very good. Christine, someone says, wow, this is really important. We know they can get your book. If they want to get more information about you or possibly they might be in an organization where they would really appreciate you coming in to speak to them, to give them practical tips and help. I know you do that. You help a lot of people as a professional speaker that you are. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, my email address is uh, Christine, with the C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, at Christine Clifford. Dot com and Clifford's like the big red dog, C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D. They can go to my website, cancerclub.com, and I also have a website, christineclifford.com. And all my books can be found at Amazon and Barnes & Noble if you just Google my name. And uh, I'd love to hear from all of your listeners out there. Very good. Well, Christine, we really appreciate you. And you are a person that gives us hope and you give us uh, the strength to keep going. You beat this terrible C word twice Twice. and now doing well. I understand you're doing very well, feeling good. Is that right? Fabulous. Knock on wood, which I'm doing. Excellent. Yes. And keep going. We're wishing you success for at least another 3,875 years. (laughs) Minimum. Thank you, Terry. Christine, you've helped the world in many ways. You've helped those of us that know you. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And don't forget to laugh. (laughs) Absolutely. That's right. Well, those of you that are joining us now, Christine is a person you want to follow up with. Find out if you are going through cancer right now. This is a resource that can really help you. Her book is great. If you have some friends or you've been told that a friend, a loved one, a colleague has cancer, this is something that would be very good. I know it helped me a lot because there's that awkward feeling of which way do we go? What do we do? And this uh, this book right here is just one of many that she's written. Wealth of information. Go over to christineclifford.com and you'll find a wealth of information. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Terry Brock and I will look forward to hearing from you.